Hello, today my presentation is on mitral transcaptor edge to edge repair or tier step by step to maximize efficiency and reproducibility. Here are my disclosures. So today we're gonna to talk about the MitraClip G4 system. This system has four different clips of different sizes and length, and you can see that here. And we're gonna teach you today how to do a MitraClip tier procedure that is reproducible, efficient, with optimal MR reduction. And this is very important now because as transcaptor mitral valve intervention continue to expand and grow, not just in terms of the volume, but also all of us are getting busier with structural heart procedures. We need to come up with ways that can make the procedure teachable, even with novices and people who are first time implanters and imagers so that they can have the same result that an experience in center like ours can achieve. So the principles of mitral tier is as it follows. You want to optimize leaflet co-optation and the mitral clip design is such that you can actually increase co-optation. That's how you reduce the MR reduction. That, that is the principles we use uh, in surgery as well. We also want to optimize MR reduction because now moderate is no longer good enough unless the anatomy precludes you from achieving one plus or better MR. Like in surgery, you want to achieve as little MR at the end of the procedure as possible, especially in primary MR, because we know that improves survival and reduces recurrence. And finally, we know that TIER actually promotes indirect annuloplasty, and we actually published some papers on this aspect as well. Now, how do you select which clip to use uh, for your procedure? Well, we first go by leaflet length. So if the leaflet length is nine or more millimeters, we tend to use the longer clip, the XT or XTW. Otherwise, you use the NT-NTW. Of course, it also depends on the mitral valve area and starting gradient as well, because sometimes even though the leaflets are long, you might not want to use the longer clips because it can risk mitral stenosis. Now, the other thing to remember is that the AP dimension is very important. If the AP dimension is short, you need to use a smaller clip. The reason being that if you use the longer clip and you improve the leaflet co-optation, you might inadvertently pucker the annulus because now this center part, let's say A2P2 is pulled in. And so they have MR reduction there, but then your jet actually comes from either side. So actually you don't want that. You want to maintain a D-shaped type of annulus. So you would do a smaller clip that way, less puckering, but you still get the MR reduction that you want. We typically now with G4 system, you can use XTW or NTW, the wider clip to start. And usually one clip is sufficient to reduce the MR to one plus or better. However, in a broader jet, you need two clip strategy. And you should start with that right off the bat. Now, we now prefer using a wider clip, an XTW, NTW. And if a second clip is necessary, do an XT or NT. Because we feel that by having a wider clip and a narrower clip, against next to each other, you reduce the jet between the clips and so less likely to have a gap between the two. And we find that based on experience, this is kind of optimal clip combination. Now, how do you pick the order of the clip? We like to say it's outside in. What that means is that you go from the commissure, if there's a pathology there, and you work your way towards the center. Why? Because if you put one in the middle already, and there's another pathology next to it, you're gonna render from off a smaller orifice and then you might get stuck with your device. So you have less room to maneuver. So obviously if the pathology is in the middle, you want to start medial to lateral because medial is harder to get to based on the septum location. But if the pathology is lateral, you wanna start lateral, need a commission and work yourself towards the center because you put one clip, let's say in lateral, but you have something else, then you closer to commercial, you're not going to have enough space to get into it. So it's very important for you to think of that in terms of your strategy. Now, what we do in our center is that we screen these patients at our clinic with TE the same way we do it during the procedure. Why? Because then you, there are no surprises during the procedure. You know exactly the kind of imaging quality you're going to get. 
you plan the procedure ahead, just like a TAVI or TAVA procedure, you use CT to plan what type of valve, which access you're going to do, any potential challenges, same thing with mitral tear. Here, what we do is that we look at the bicommercial explain to LVOT view, that's called a grasping view with or without color to show where the pathology is and where the jet is. And you do a sweep lateral to medial or vice versa to interrogate the anatomy, pathology, leaflet length, where the jet is and how wide the jet is and the target grasping location. So you will be able to figure out how many clips you'll need, what clips you need and where you're gonna clip. The 3D on force is very important. And we place the commission at 10 and two o'clock with or without color to show the atomic surgeon's view equivalent to see how the anatomy and pathology looks. And finally, for transeptal access, we use a bi-cable explain to a reverse aortic valve short axis or four chamber view, and you sweep superiorly from the SVC down inferior to the fossa, because that's usually the direction of how the septum will be engaged with your transeptal needle system. And now finally, do, do the explain view to show how anterior or posterior you are on the septum so that you optimize your puncture location. Now, how do you optimize the procedure from the get-go? So when the patient is in a room, you first saw after intubation, you minimize the tidal volume to reduce respiratory erosion, especially in patients with hyperdynamic LV. You don't want the clip to keep shifting with your target and you make it very easy, difficult to grasp, especially for large flail prolapse or big gaps. You want to make sure the patient is somewhat euvolemic. You might need to give diuretics, especially if the patient has secondary MR, to, uh, such that the co-optation gap can be reduced, especially when it's challenging the grasp. And of course, you can maximize the procedural safety and efficiency by minimizing gel anesthesia time and TE probe manipulation because those two are not benign, especially in elderly or frail patients. So let me give you a textbook case here uh, to show you how we do these procedures. The 70-year-old female, severe MR with EF 45%, cardiomyopathy without CRTD, morbid obesity, and amplitude walker. Clearly a high surgical risk despite a low STS score. And this patient actually has a mixed etiology. The patient has cardiomyopathy, LV dilatation, but also an A2 flare. So here's how it looks like here. You can see that on the left side, you have a bicommercial view, lateral and medial, and then posterior anterior when you explain. So you can see what the grasping view looks like, and you can clearly see the A2 flare. Now, this view is very important when you do it. It's just not any kind of bicommercial view. You want to make sure the apex is 6 o'clock. Why? Because when the cursor beams across the mitral valve, it's orthogonal to the annular plane. And so when the mitral clip goes down here during the procedure, you know exactly where the clip arms will be located, how rotated it's going to be. So when you beam, you, you see the arm very well. And so you know that you're orthogonal to the target and the co-optation line. Of course, you now add color to see the severity of the MR. As you can see, clearly it's a severe eccentric MR. Now, what we do here is now the sweep. So we start medial, you can see that here, there's no pathology and there's no jet. And then you systematically put the cursor now towards the center where the pathology is in this case. And then you just keep acquiring these images so that you have captured them, especially if the pathology is broad or eccentric or asymmetric. And then finally, you go to the lateral side. Again, you can see uh, there's not much pathology there when you explain and you can see the color as well. So this is a systematic interrogation of the valve and so that you can plan the procedure ahead. Next, we look at the target grasping location in terms of leaflet length. You go all the way to the annulus, the leaflet tip. Beware, you don't want to measure the quartz because quartz don't count, it's the leaflet itself. And then of course, you also look at the anterior leaflet. You can go at the hinge point, you can go all the way to the aorto, um, aortic valve to measure the total length. The reason being that when you grasp, you want to be able to subtract a difference to see how much was actually inserted in the clip itself. Next is the 3D on force that we call surgeon's view. You can see that here, you make sure that your commissures are 10 and 2 o'clock. Now, of course, the aortic valve has to be up top, but we don't need it to be at 12 o'clock. That is incorrect because we know that the aortic valve and the mitral has different relationships based on different patients. So you cannot be prescriptive and say that the aortic valve is 12 o'clock because the mitral valve may not be at a 10 and two orientation with the commissures. And this is critical between the imager and the implanter in terms of having the same language and orientation. So for example, 
if the pathology here is 12 and 6 in terms of optimal clip orientation, if your commissure is not at 10 and 2, let's say at 11 and 3, your 10, 12 and 6 o'clock orientation would be wrong because that is not perpendicular to the grasping uh, plane. So that's why it's very important to make sure you have this 10 and 2 o'clock at all the time when you communicate with each other during the procedure. And you can see, of course, the color at the baseline so you can assess it after the patient, uh, the clip has been grasped, the leaflets. Now this, we again, we do it at the pre-case planning phase, at the initial screening. We don't, this is obviously what we also want to reproduce during the procedure. Now here's the procedure. Uh, at the same time, you can also do that at the screening as well, is this transeptal, which is by cable. You can see the landmarks here. And then what you do when you explain, this is the septum, and you can see this is posterior. This is anterior where the mitral valve analysis. And so you can see how posterior you are. So here's an example where we use a transeptal system where the arrow is, that's at the mid fossa. And when you beam across that, you can see that the uh, posterior aspect of the tenting. Now you have to beam at the tip of the tent, not the body of the shaft of the apparatus, because that you're going to be misled and you think might be actually end up more posterior than you think in terms of your tenting, and you might actually cause a pericardial fusion if you're not careful. So make sure you explain at the tip of the transeptal needle uh, or whatever system you use. At the same time, when we come down, remember typically the system comes from superiorly down to the fossa. You want to start by beaming the SVC and you can see when you explain how posterior you are, and then you do your sweep down progressively down to the fossa to track the needle so you know where it's going on echo. And of course you do it on fluoroscopy as well. So once you have the tenting done, you want to do an aortic valve short axis view that you see here. And then you measure on a four chamber view here based on the, to get the transeptal height. Now with mitral clip G4 system with the longer clip, the XTs, you want to be at least four centimeter, preferably higher if you can. It's always easier to shed height than to gain height afterwards. And you can see you have to be perpendicular in your measurement like what we show here. Now, after this, you can see we got a puncture and you always want to puncture with two views on echo and you can see it on floral to match. And you can see that here, the puncture takes place. You can see that here, you know exactly how posterior you are because sometimes when you puncture can slip and you don't want to slip posteriorly when you puncture. Now, how about fluoroscopy? How do you actually see this on fluoroscopy and, and match it with echo? So mitral clip procedure or any tier uh, is a echo guided fluoroscopy procedure. So you want to see how it works. So you can see the spine is here in the yellow, uh, so orange hash line, and your transeptal needle should be at the right side of the spine. If you're on the left side of the spine on an RAO projection that you've seen here, you're too posterior. And you can see in this particular case, it's very nice landmark to see the CRT device or the coronary sinus lead. And we know that the coronary sinus is above the mitral annulus. So you can see that how the distance looks. And you can see where the mitral valve is. And often there are other landmarks that are helpful. So for example, if there's a circumflex artery that has stands in there, that runs along the AB groove and that shows you where actually the mitral annulus would be. Similarly, if you have mitral annulus classification or MAC, you also see whether it is as well as if you have an aneoplasty ring. So this is highly helpful. And because fluoroscopy is such a high resolution image, we use that a lot in helping to streamline our workflow with the mitral clip procedure. Now, after you do the transeptal, you will pass a stiff wire at the left upper pulmonary vein. You can see that here. If you go more anterior, that's the left atrial appendage. Uh, obviously be careful about that. Uh, it's not the end of the world if you end up being there with a the stiff wire, but be careful not to push hard and avoid a perforation. But this is gonna be important in terms of how far your runway is when you advance the mitral clip guide and your clip towards the left atrium. So here you go, you can see the guide is now going in. Again, you do use biplane on the echo. You can see the fossa, the same view that we use for transeptal puncture. You can see how posterior it is and make sure there's no tenting as you uh, pop your guide in there because then if you remove the dilator too early, you can actually not actually in the left atrium. And you can see how much guy there is. And it's important for the amateur to put the cursor at the tip of the guy, not the body, the tip, because that's where the, the uh, tip might end up interacting with the left atrial structures. 
So now the clip is coming out. You can see that what we do typically is this motion. The clip is advancing forward while the echoes focus on the tip of the clip and you pull the guy back to straddle. So you can see that here in floral, you bring the guy back, uh, the S SGC, uh, the, uh, and then you advance the CDS the, to forward. And you know from the previous floor image, we say this and put on reference that this is the stiff wire. So you know that's the pulmonary vein. You know also that this red line is the no fly zone. You don't want to advance the clip into the pulmonary vein. So you know how much runway you have on floral in addition to see it on echo, especially in case the echo imaging is suboptimal. So you can do this on floral itself. So here's how it works. You can see that this particular video, you can see that my partner here uh, bring the stabilizer back, meaning to bring the guy back while you advance the clip here to straddle. So this is a very much a reproducible way to actually do this. And you can also see that obviously on echo as well. So once you have straddling, you then do your standard M knob steer and then posterior guide torque. You can see that how it looks on floral. With aerial projection, typically you see a 90 degree turn on your uh, CDS. And also then you start jiggle jiggle with your clip to optimize the orientation right away on the fluoroscopic view. There's really no need to wait for echo. And so here you can see as long as you pass the Cubitin Ridge, uh, you, you save to proceed to the mitral valve. And in fact, this is how it's done. You can see that here with the M knob and posterior guide torque, you can see how the valve is steering down. You can see some map here as a landmark where the mitral analysis is. And you can see that he would retract the DC faster to uh, avoid the slack. And you can see also on echo at the same time, the imager is putting the cursor right at the tip of the clip to follow so to be able to show how posterior or anterior you are. So again, you can see that being repeated here uh, during the replay. Now, after this, we do the jiggle jiggle, as I mentioned, what that's for is that you preemptively align the clip in the optimal orientation. And you can see that here on echo and floral, uh, because what happens is that you can also see that in the bicommissural view now, so while you do this, the echo imager go to the bicommissural view with the apex at six o'clock, you explain on the clip, and then you should bring the clip into view in terms of how uh, the orientation and trajectory will look. Of course, at this time, you will test the trajectory and also you want to make sure that you're not too aiming too much. So once you have the bicomics plane view, you open the clip, you can check the grippers on the echo, Remember to check the grippers, both tactile and non-tactile to see which is which. And you want to do it very slowly so that the imager can capture the loop to confirm the orientation of the clip in terms of the gripper arms. So here's how it works. You can see raise grippers, unlock the clip, and you can see now the clip is open. And then you check each one. So in this case, for example, we're going to start with unlatch the uh, gripper, you drop, here, you see that, and you can see the posterior uh, gripper arm coming down, and then you can see now the anterior gripper coming down and up. So you want to check that, and then you relatch, and then you confirm your gripper orientation. So now we do the 3D on false view. I've already mentioned this before. You need to make sure you are 10 and 2 o'clock for your commissure. I really don't care where the aortic valve sits as long as it's hot up there. And then you make sure that you're 12 and 6, as you see it in our case. That's where the jet is located. You can see that whip color. And so you optimize the orientation. And here's how you do that. So for example, you can see that this particular clips is a little bit more medial. So we're gonna advance the whole stabilizer to make it more central. And you can do that during this step. Now this next step is critical because you wanna make sure when you go into the uh, LV, you are off staying in the lane. You don't want to go lateral dive. You can see that here, if you go on the floor on the top part of the screen, that's a lateral dive. If you go down towards the bottom of the screen, that's a medial dive. You want to stay in that green line. So how do you see that on floral? You look at the landmark. So you can see this clip is right at the top of this rib. So it should stay on top of this rib. It should not go in the bottom of the rib and it should not go in the interspace. So that's how you can tell uh, when you do that and you close the clip, you always want to make sure there's no parallax because you already have your clip orientation optimized on echo. So this is kind of your working view for the rest of the procedure for this particular case. So here you go. This is on echo. You show that you want to be in the, going into the valve in terms of trajectory towards the center. 
perpendicular to the end of the plane. Same thing with the grasping view. You want to be showing straight down, not posterior towards the posterior wall. That's a posterior dive. And then anterior dive towards the anterior leaflet. So you want to make sure you stay that way on floral and echo. And you can see that here, it goes in, as, as I mentioned before, you want to make sure that this is the case. Now, if you have uh, going medial dive, uh, your corrective action will be undo the uh, arms to swing back to a center. If you're diving lateral, you want to aim more to maintain the project, uh, the perpendicularity. If you advance or retract the system, that is incorrect because that will still not correct the trajectory itself. So it's very important to make a point of this. In terms of the LVOT grasping view, if you go in posterior guide clock, you want to be able to counter clock the guide to go anterior and vice versa. So here again, you can see the orientation of the clip on the bicommercial view. You should not see any clip arms. And when you explain that, you should see the clip arms wide open. And you should see that the clip has not rotated when you cross into the ventricle. So here's the example how it's done. So it's very important that you see how the operator here actually rotates the DC flash to maintain the clip orientation. And you can see that here as well, the clip uh, here, again, to show that it maintains the orientation on echo and floral, especially floral. Because even a little bit of orientation rotation on the clip on floral may not be seen on echoes. Very so we go by floral to make sure. And you can see how we do it. We use our fingers, a thumb, index, and middle finger to control the DC fastener, while your in uh, ring finger and pinky finger hold on to the stabilizer to actually allow you to uh, maximize your stability on the device when you go in. And of course, you would also have your left hand on the guy to be able to rotate anteriorly or, or posterior, as you see here, to make sure the orientation is maintained. So once you're ready to grasp, you come up, you also again want to make sure the clip comes up straight and also not rotated. How do I know that on floral? Make sure your clip arms don't have parallax. You see that it's a single arm visualization. When you come up, it should remain the same. Especially when you do posterior guide talk, if you do too much, you can actually see that the parallax start to emerge and you want to correct that by, by uh, re correcting that uh, to maintain the no parallax during the grasping because otherwise you're going to twist about. So you can see that now the clip is coming up to grass and you, see, you can see how slowly we drop the grippers on this here because you want the image to see exactly how much tissue you, you enter. If you insert and you op want to optimize because that's the feature of G4 that you can independently grasp this leaflet and optimize them, you, what you should do uh, is to do the posterior guide talk to get more posterior before you raise the grippers. That way, what you do, you get as much posterior leaflet as you can. You raise the grippers, confirm that you have good leaflet insertion and drop it again. That will allow you to confirm that you have all the leaflet in place. If you raise the grippers and the leaflet fall out, then obviously you have never had enough. So that's a very good way to check whether you have sufficient leaflet to start with. So we not infrequently do this to just to make sure we have all the leaflets in there. Especially if you worry about leaflet curling up or folded on itself, it might look good, but at the same time, you actually may never have enough leaflet to start with. So this is a very important point when you try to optimize, is that you go towards the direction of the leaflet, don't raise the grippers yet. Once you're ready, raise the grippers slowly to visualize you have good enough leaflet, you might optimize the insertion, then drop the grippers again to confirm that you have all the leaflets you want. Now you can see that here, how this works. So you can see that on floral, there's no parallax on the, on the clip arms, because if you do, then you have rotate the clip. Doesn't matter what echo tells you, because echo uh, might not be actually uh, completely accurate because of the resolution. So you can see that here, the grippers uh, are now ready to be dropped, and you can see the clip arms as well. So let's see this again. You can see he's going posteriorly to get more posterior leaflet. As you come up, you maintain the orientation on floral. And then once it's ready, you're ready to drop the grippers. You let your uh, other operate, your assistant to do that for you because while sometimes the challenging anatomy, you cannot do it yourself. You need someone else to help you drop the grippers slowly to be able to visualize it because you need basically three sets of hands to be able to get a successful grasp, especially in very challenging anatomies.
So here's how it works. Once you grasp and you drop the grippers and you want to close the clip, we now lock the clip first uh, because we feel that it's more secure. And you can see as you close the clip, you want to give back tension so you advance the CDS because you don't want the clip arms to be above the analyst. Then you might risk uh, losing leaflet capture. You want to advance thumb below the annular plane. That's where the natural uh, leaflet of the co-optation are, not above, but below, even if the pathology is a flare or prolapse. And also you want to give back uh, tension, but you want to go a little bit slightly posterior guide torque to avoid losing the posterior leaflet because typically the posterior leaflet is a shorter of the two. So once you close the clip, you want to assess the MR. And of course you want to check the insertion as well. And you can see that here, this is a single operator. Uh, closer, you lock the clip once you're happy. Uh, and then you now start to close slowly and you give back. You can see what the person uh, is doing. Again, with thumb, index, and middle finger holding the DC fastener. And then with the stabilizer, uh, stable supported by the pinky and the ring finger. And then now he goes more posterior guide torque just to make sure he has not lost any posterior leaflet during the closing. So now, of course, once you check the leaflet insertion on 2D, you make sure you sweep medial and lateral to the clip to make sure you have insertion. You can do the leaflet length subtraction. Uh, you can now do 3D on false to check for color and also tissue bridge. And once you're happy, then you can proceed to deploy the clip uh, because, of course, you want to check mitral valve gradient. You want to check pulmonary main flow. What we found is that if the pulmonary main flow improves after the grasping, we think that the patient will benefit clinically because now you're more forward flow compared to before. So here you see the pin release. You have to be very careful because you have a lot of posterior guide talk before to grasp and to offset uh, when you close. You want to be able to count the clock, the guy a little bit so that the needle, when you deploy, doesn't hit the posterior part of the left atrial wall. So this is very important to consider uh, when you uh, deploy the clip. So here's the final result. You can see that here, uh, trivial MR, and you can see the nice teaser bridge. And you can see the clip on this same REO view has not spun or rotated because you still see there are no parallax on the clip arms. You can see it's perpendicular to the CS lead. Of course, you assess the AST in terms of size and directional flow. And this procedure, despite our lecture quite long here, took only 10 minutes in expert hands, but you can see that we're very systematic and methodical about how we do the procedure, just a tablet. So it's very important that this procedure is reproducible and we've done all this uh, types of workflow in terms of training all our physicians, all our implanters, and amateurs, and also our trainees as they went on to graduate and run their own program the same way. And feel that this is, uh, makes the procedure very reproducible even with inexperienced uh, operators and imagers. The patient had immediate improvement in symptoms for discharge home the next day on optimal GDMT. So here's a transverse echo next day. We always do echo the next day just to check to make sure you can see there's really uh, no significant MR to speak of. So in summary, the mitral tier with mitral clip G4 can be done safely and efficiently with excellent MR reduction, as you saw earlier. This procedure is TE guided by floral assisted and is highly standardized. The key to standardize the T imaging at the beginning during acquisitions at your clinic so that you can plan the procedure ahead and anticipate any challenges in terms of anatomy or imaging quality. And so now during the procedure, you can reproduce those same views, same angles. And now with meticulous flow assistance, you can do the procedure efficiently and expeditiously and also with great outcomes. Now, both imager and implanter need to see both T and flow at all times so the Image can also see what you're doing on floral to be able to understand what you're doing with the device. At the same time, the implant need to see echo, obviously, to be able to tell the imager what we're doing so they can come to see us as well if they have trouble finding the device. Finally, the pitfalls, I would say the clip motivation, if you're off during the LV entry or grasping, you can twist the valve and cause more MR and lead to suboptimal reduction in MR. And also, you have to be careful inadequate leaf insertion during clip closure and if you fail to optimize, you can risk single leaflet device attachment or SLDA. So you have to be very vigilant about that. Always, if you're concerned about it, there's no harm done now with MitroClip G4 to confirm and optimize the leaflet insertion. SLDA is a very challenging situation to deal with as 
we have all experienced in our career. So I want to bring to your attention of my YouTube channel. You can look it up here. Uh, we've now actually posted all the MicroClip G4 demo video on the bench. You can see that there are 19 steps that we put in on how to do this on the bench model to teach you how to use the device, how to straddle, how to drop the grippers and test the grippers, uh, how to actually do the grasp, and how to optimize sleep insertion. So I hope with those uh, demo videos along this lecture that will help you uh, perform your first or 10th or 100th microclip tier procedure successfully. And thank you very much for your attention.